Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the LSE Transfer Room. I'm Dan. We have Reese, Dan, and Alan uh, going to be joining us this Sunday. We're going to be discussing Fabio Carvalho, the return. Was he pushed out? Was he moved away? He's made some really interesting comments, which I think a lot of people maybe had guessed at, which we're going to be discussing around and see what his future is going to be under our new management. And then a perfect segue going into that one is discussing our manager options. We spoke about Alonso. We're going to talk about him. We spoke about Ruben Amarin. We're going to talk about him too. Julian Nagelsmann, we spoke about him. We're kind of getting a little bit down the line of people who may be interested in that uh, that manager, but he fits the profile. And then somebody who we haven't discussed here yet and it hasn't been discussed in a lot of places quite yet, and it'd be interesting to see why, and that's a certain manager called Roger Smith from Benfica. The numbers match up. The data adds up. He's a proven manager who knows how to do things. So why not? And that's what we're going to go into. So um, just before we get started, let's go around the room. Reese. How are you, mate? Thanks for joining us. And, um, yeah, just let us know what your current LFC thoughts are of this season. Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. I hope everyone's good. Um, in terms of w which conversation first, the manager or Cavalli? <laughs> just, 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 uh, well, we'll jump in. Just how you feel at the moment, just about everything where the club is up to. We've had the, the news about Edwards. We've had the news about R Richard Hughes coming in there. How does it make you all feel now that, we're going to get a new manager and that could be quite scary, but how do you feel about where the club is at the moment? Uh, in terms of the direction where Liverpool is going, I'm very excited for the future. Um, I think this season, uh, uh, before the start of the season, I would have took that like, top four, maybe challenge for a trophy, but I think we're ahead of schedule for at least a year, but that's good for us. And then I'm quite excited, even though Klopp's leaving and that's a big loss. I think what, what FSG are trying to put in place with uh, Edwards coming back and Hughes and then now we just need a manager. I'm quite excited uh, for the future like, with Liverpool. No, definitely. I can definitely feel that one as well. Good to hear. Uh, Alan, same question to yourself. How are you feeling? How are you and, and how are you feeling about the current Liverpool setup? Are you feeling confident that we're going into the future in the best possible shape? Um, I'm good, thanks guys. I hope everyone is watching is also having a good weekend. Um, ready for the busy week. Um, regarding um, the club, I think the club are in quite a good position. Um, I think Klopp, obviously, we all wish he was going to stay, but obviously he's decided he's obviously going to go. But I think he's leaving us in a really good position squad-wise. The, the nucleus of the squad is there for all to see. You can actually see some of the players that we've got you know, future wise, there's quite a high scene for a lot of those players. And obviously, they're going to come on to Carvalho chat a little bit. But I think the squad that we've got, it's one of those ones, no matter who comes in manager wise, they've got quite a massive head start. It's not, if you go back so far back, you know, when I go in Fergus and left United, he left an old team. Go back to Liverpool City when Dagleaf left, he left an old team. It wasn't a lot of youngsters coming through now. Granted, he left under unfortunate circumstances. Um, but I do think Klopp is leaving um, the squad in a really good position. So I think exciting times ahead. Let's just hope we send them off with the main one, which we all want, which is the Premier League. Most definitely. And, and, and you've raised some really, really good points there, to be honest with you. It's, it, it's true. There's not a lot of occasions where a manager leaves the team in a stronger position than when he joins, or perhaps a position which is almost enviable because it's a bit of an egotistical position, isn't it? Football, especially in management, is the case of that's what he's built, that's what he has grown with the people around him, and he's he's basically leaving this this team who I feel is is more than ready next season to to be challenging for a title. With a few additions, you know, we could go even further. So, yeah, absolutely, really good points. Uh, Dan, same question to yourself. How are you? How's everything going? And your feelings um, of the club going forward? Are you are you still very confident? You're happy with the decisions the club's made at the, the board level? Uh, I mean, I think as, as happy as you can be with, I mean, I think when we were stream, did a stream like earlier, like I think in J January or February, we talked about like I had said, like, I don't think Edwards comes back as sporting director. He probably comes in some sort of like CEO executive role, which he eventually they gave him. Essentially, he's doing Mike Gordon's job, but he's going to be in Liverpool rather than Boston. And he's essentially just he's 
doing all of Mike Gordon's work, except more sports oriented or almost exclusively sports oriented, but not just for him, as we've learned now with uh, the larger um, FSG um, soccer football area, where they're now going to look for a second club, which they have been talking about doing for, I think, seven or eight years at this point. Um, I mean, as confident as we can be, you know, going into this uh, summer, we were worried about like who's the sporting director going to be. We had York Schmacka, who did a pretty decent job, who was just there mostly to facilitate Klopp. Now we get Richard Hughes in. We have Edwards back. They're bringing the new, uh, the, this other chief scout over as well, which I imagine is probably because they're going to move some people around from the scouting department, like Barry Hunter, Alex Inglethorpe, because I think uh, Yaros is probably going to, I don't know if he's leaving or they're they're going to be rejigging a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, but it's mostly like bringing people in to fill positions rather than having to recreate a new structure. I think on a macro sense, like we're in the best possible position than we were like seven, eight, nine years ago. You know, if you think about when Klopp took over in 2015, you know, we had spent all that money on Christian Benteke. We had brought, we had just bought a Roberto Firmino. Like we were nowhere near the, we, we were a big, big club air quotes, you know, in the same way that, you know, uh, that, you know, maybe Villa were a big club at the time or right now in the sense of like, you know, massive fan base, great history, yada, yada. But there it hadn't, we hadn't been seven, eight, nine years going back to Benitez's days. So to go from where we were to now, like Liverpool right now are essentially paying wages on the, on the level of a Madrid, a Barcelona, not to Barcelona's extreme financially regulated, uh, financially it's the stable degree, but Liverpool right now are one of the top paying clubs in the world. We're the top revenue. Everything on the macro sense is great. Um, I've said at the beginning, I thought we had a good chance to win the league and we were going to win the quad. Sadly, everyone went a bit mad at Old Trafford and that didn't happen. But, you know, the it was the least Im- it was the least important game of the entire season. And that's the one we lost. I think I'm OK with that. Yeah, uh, a lot to unpack there. A lot of things for me to, to get out the suitcase and, and to, to put in there. I absolutely agree with you. Liverpool, when FSG came in, I am an FSG supporter, not onto the point of FSG for life. However, I do feel that they are perhaps the best ownership in the league. And I say that with no hint of irony, because as much as, as every owner does, as every business person gets things wrong, FSG have got things wrong on the pitch and off the pitch. They've made bad decisions when it comes to signings. But then again, they were never involved in football before and they've had to take a lot of risk and a lot of trust in certain people. They trusted certain managers. It failed them. They trusted certain people off the pitch. It hasn't worked. And they haven't quite got the culture of the of the club and the city quite right sometimes. But what I think FSG do quite well is when they do get something wrong, most of the time, they get it right the second time. They fix the problems. They listen to the people. And they're quite happy. Last has shown with Michael Edwards is it's not to close the door on people in business where what will happen sometimes is, right, um, you've left. You're not coming back. You've turned your back on us. And what we've seen is we've actually seen that they've gone and said, will you come back? No. Will you come back and see your role for more money? No. Okay, then. Will you do it if I give you my job? And I think that takes quite a little bit of respect to say that they know how in, how knowledgeable this guy is, Michael Edwards. And I'm I'm really impressed by how well they are doing in that respect. It's very um, funny. So it, 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 I was going to say in the athletic piece they wrote, they said they were interviewing Mike. They were talking about how the process was going. They said that they had been looking for two years to replace uh, after Ward and Edwards both left. And they said they spent two years and they said, we've looked at everyone. And all we said is like, actually, Michael's still the best person for the job. And it's yeah. even said that Mike Gordon realized during negotiations, probably the only thing he could possibly do. And I think this is where the report came out that he wants total football control. Is it like he's only going to take this job if I give him my job, essentially? And yeah, it was really funny to actually read that. Cause it's yeah, like, it's- and, and absolutely. I mean, it takes some, you know, to take the ego aside from it at that level, the ego is right that they're, they're the people who always believe they're the best person for the job. They'll never sit there and say, I don't think I'm right for this one. But for them to sit there and say, actually, we've looked and we've looked and we've researched and we've researched and the guy that we actually had was the best guy in the first place. And what we need to do is go back and get him back. And I, I have respect for them in that respect. So quickly, one of the, Tony Bloom is the best owner in the Premier League. Tony Bloom's the best owner on making money. He's the best owner for making money for his club. 
and for himself. It, it, the Brighton are an interesting point. They're under one metric, very good. However, this season, mm, there's not really been a lot of movement, has there, to be honest. Quite happy to sell the best players, but they've not been able to replace them this time around. Um, how do you measure the best owner? Exactly. There's multiple metrics, so it's it's not a, a simple question. Um, but yeah, anyway, going on to the chat for this evening, because we could talk about FSG all evening, and I do not have the time, <laughs> to be totally honest with you, and nor do I have the energy. So I will get into our chat that we were going to be discussing this evening, which is Fabio Carvalho, the return. And I, for one, am really excited. I don't know about you guys. I, I, I liked him as a player. I was very excited. Actually, you know, the real question was, I was actually quite disappointed in the January 22 when we didn't get him on the deadline day, I was actually gutted that it didn't go through and the paperwork wasn't complete at the time. And that was kind of striking because I was interested to see what he was going to offer us as a different type of player because he's a 10 and he doesn't play this sort of winger and he's not a striker and he's someone who could play in behind. It left quite a little bit of a an intrigue, to be totally honest with you, as to where are we going as a team as a formation change coming and we're going to play with you know like a 10 again and we're going to play with like a Coutinho and and that was quite exciting but it never it never really happened did it he scored some important goals played a few games he scored the quite historic I think late winner against uh, Newcastle it was it perhaps our latest goal except for when Nunes did it recently um against Nottingham Forest and he moved on which was a real shame and he's made some comments um recently about when he's he's going to be coming back one he said so i'm going to read them verbatim for everyone and just those who haven't read them or heard them so he was good um jürgen klopp's helped me but when i arrived at the club they were in a difficult period on and off the field carvalho said when asked while it was like to work with klopp he says there were problems for the team and he needed to turn to the players he trusted the most i just arrived and he didn't have the greatest confidence in me but he always helped me a lot and pointed out what i needed to do better and what i shouldn't do but we had players there with a lot of experience who were playing very well, even though the team was not at its best. I was there to learn and continue training. Um, Carvalho then went on to admit his surprise when he learned that Klopp um, would be leaving the club in the summer and Klopp announced in January he would be stepping down from his role as Liverpool manager of the season. Yes, a little, Carvalho said when he was surprised by the Klopp's announcement. He loves Liverpool and the club and he, fans love him like I do. Now, with those comments ringing in our ears now, I, I tend to agree because we were in a really poor state. We were in a poor state for a lot of our signings who came in, who struggled. Darwin Nunes was another one of those players who who struggled from a Liverpool team who weren't playing very well. And I think maybe because Nunes was a little bit further down the line in his in his experience, the fact that he was there to replace, you know, like a, what it was a role that we already had in, in a number nine. And we weren't ready to try and bring in new players and try and bed them in and teach them. And we needed results right now. And I, I think he was a little bit of a victim of it. Um, Reese, Fabio Carvalho, what did you make of him when he first signed and, when, and, and the games? Did you, Is there anything that, that struck you out as to why he could have potentially not worked out so far under Klopp? Uh, for me, I liked him as a player. I didn't know much about him, but then I looked, I saw a few of his forms for Fulham. When he came in for us, I think he done quite well, considering he weren't playing all the time. He kind of just... Uh, did what he could with what minutes he was getting, scored a couple of important goals. I think personally, he didn't really play in the right position because he's more of a 10 in it. So, say, say if, um, for example, if Alonso or someone comes in, I think they'll be able to get a uh, better use out of him. And obviously, it's nice to hear the comments that he said about Klopp that he said, um, even though he didn't play all the time, he told him he would things how to improve his game, uh, certain things what to do and what not to do. But yeah, I've always liked him. I think he's a a, a good player. I just think, obviously, uh, obviously it's Liverpool, so there's a lot of there's a lot of options in each position. So hopefully, when he comes back, it should um, work out um, next season. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm really excited to see it because he's 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 gone away to Leipzig. It didn't quite work out for him there, which was a bit concerning. Um, but then he's gone away, come back, gone to Hull. And so far, so good, to be honest with you. It seems to be working really well down there and he's scoring some goals, he's getting some assists. We we trust Hull as a club to develop our players. Tyler Morton's out there at the moment. So I'm quite comfortable with that one. Um, Dan, Fabio Carvalho, your your views of the early, the early Carvalho and, and was he a victim of, of an unfortunate situation with the club or was it down to him? Uh, 
I, I think it was a combination of different factors. I, I think we when we bought Fabio Car- Carvalho, I actually wanted him in January as well, be going into that uh, quadruple season because he was he was a talented young player. I mean, you can just see him when he plays. You know, he's very much kind of in that heart. Paul I beat me to the punch. Thank you, Paul, as always. Um, that he was essentially a tanned creative player that was going to go through some sort of transformation process and either be turned into a midfielder, a box eight, or like someone who's like a 10 who can also play as a nine. Like I, I always thought Fabio Carvalho would be like a Roberto Firmino like player. I think that he, the reason he didn't end up getting that role was more because of Cody Gakpo coming in and Doran also struggling at, at that time as well. And the fact that Firmino was still there, that was more against than anything else. I, I mean, every time I saw Fabio Carvalho play, you can tell there's something about him. Like he scored, he, he, he won, he's a natural goal scorer, which is really weird to say because he only had three goals with us in 21 games, but he always had a good knack of positioning sense. Like he scores uh, against Med City in the FA Cup. He obviously scores the late winner against Newcastle, which he scores on a half volley on a high bounce and kicks it above Pope into the bar and it goes in. Like, like that's a crazy amount. Like that's a natural striker's goal that he does. I think that what we needed at that time, because we were in such a difficult place, was a lot of running, a lot of intensity, and a lot of pressing, which I know I just have three things that are essentially the same, but I meant like that he did not cover a lot of the pitch, and what he was good at was not what we needed at the time period. What he wasn't good at was pressing, and that was his big thing, and that's what you know Klopp famously says, I think, in March, pressing is a way into this team, and that's how you get... Uh, March from last year, he says pressing is the way you get into this team, and no matter how well you do, you have to be able to press. And that's where Darwin has gotten so much better this year is that he's a much better presser. His all-around game has massively improved. His goal scoring has improved as well. I know some people were not – like he could still score more goals. We can all agree, but he has definitely improved. Um, and Carvalho just didn't really get that chance. And I think that's why if you look at where he was loaned out to, Leipzig, which is – press is exactly the same as Klopp's team, more or less that counter pressing uh, with uh, Marco Rosa, who was um, up, who played with Klopp at Mainz, um, who coached at Gladbach, coached at Dortmund, coached now at Leipzig, very much does that counter press. And now at Hull, who also do that counter press that we sent Harry Wilson there, Tyler Morton there, and now uh, Fabio Carvalho, they're there to essentially get game time. He's very much a victim of the circumstances, but it was also, what he was good at was not what they needed at the time period because everyone's legs had essentially fallen off at the same time. You know, Henderson's, Fabinho's, Thiago was essentially the only one running in that midfield, which is kind of not a good sign. You know, Chamberlain was injured, Jones was injured. I can go through Kato, Navi Kato was having a Navi Kato season. So Cavalier was not in a good, it's this is there's an old saying in American sports where it's like, it's not, it's not where it's where you land it's not your attributes it's it's like where do you end up determines a lot of what how you succeed in sports you can be the most talented player but if you go to a dysfunctional situation it's almost impossible for you to see, succeed and i think with carvalho he was just in a bad situation and klopp just couldn't trust him to do what he felt he needed to do in order to get results oh yeah 100 percent. i i i do absolutely i do agree with that um I'm just looking at the numbers here because this is something which I, I think Fabio at times, I don't agree that Fabio Carvalho and Harvey Elliott can really be differentiated as to who is a 10 as the two of them are pretty much the same age. And well, we don't play Harvey Elliott as a 10. That's the point. We don't. We, he's there. He's been at the club for 100 games. And I don't think once we've played in that situation anyway. So when, when we first played Elliot, uh, before we got the Leeds injury, that's kind of how they played him, is that it was essentially like a two with Harvey kind of being that free load. I mean, I'm not, I know it's not exactly the same. I'm just kind of like hypothesizing what their thought process was when they bought him. Yeah, I mean, if we go back, and this is what I don't want to change. I don't want to change the history as to what people thought of as to when we brought in Fabio Carvalho. We brought Fabio Carvalho in. And he was a player who didn't quite fit with Liverpool's current formation. He wasn't an, he wasn't a nine. He wasn't a false nine. He wasn't a midfielder. He wasn't someone who played on the right wing. He was a 10, and that's what he played for at Fulham. And that's what was quite exciting, because there was a lot of discussion as to whether or not we would play him in behind someone like a Darwin Nunes, like 
how he played in behind. Mitrovic, who is an out-and-out number nine when he played at Fulham. And I was just looking at his number set, which was very interesting. And the numbers, which, to be honest with you, seeing them, he scored 12 goals um, and assisted eight in 44 games for Fulham. I mean, those numbers are almost a goal or an assist every half a game. They're incredibly good numbers. And, and you can see why we would be interested in bringing in a player like that. Um, great numbers in the Fulham under 18s, the under 16. So he quickly progressed, obviously, to a point where he was in the first team. And he's an exciting young talent when it comes to playing for, um, for the England setup, to be honest with you. Now, my worry was is that when he went to, um, when he came to us, he came to us, I think, at the wrong time. I think he came to us at a point where nobody was ready to, to, to or even thought that we were going to collapse the way that we did. And the midfield's legs completely fell off. Fabinho stopped being a decent player. Looked like he was running in treacle. Jordan Henderson, no different. It was an absolute mess of a season. And I don't think we were ready for trying new things. And I don't think we were ready for trying to get young players who have had no you know, Jurgen Klopp um, influence on them to come straight into our team. And it, and it hadn't quite worked out for him. And I just feel, I feel for him. And I, I really hope for me, looking at the numbers once again, Fabio Carvalho, whilst he's out at Hull, played 11 games and scored four goals. So there's a player there, isn't there? That there's, there's clearly a player there that, that, that we already have. And I don't think to say that we should be writing him off anytime soon is 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 a good idea. Uh, Reese, um, just to yourself there about Fabio, um, are you uh, w w where do you stand on him? Where do you where do you feel about where he, where he's going to come into to us next season? Do you see a place for him in our first team? Do you see a place for him in our bench? Or do you think perhaps potentially that it could end up being another loan situation? What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, if it was my choice, I'd have him in and around the squad. Um... I think the club maybe could loan him, but it depends on which manager we get and then which kind of tactics we play. Um, like Alonso, I think he plays, I don't know, he plays two tens or something like that um, for um, Bayer Leverkusen. So potentially, if Alonso came in, uh, he might be able to feature more. But um, I would be disappointed if we sold him. I'd rather loan him if he's not going to be around the squad, um, personally. Yeah, absolutely. We're getting a lot of mixed chat in here, which is quite interesting, to be honest with you, um, about Fabio. I mean, we've got um, Helio, who's obviously, you know, one of our biggest contributors to the channel. Um, he seems very excited. He looks like Carvalho looks like he's back on track, and I tend to agree with him. And we've got um, Sweets coming in. He said, Fabio's too small, lightweight, Dan, hello. Um, yeah, apparently I'm also talking BS. Fabio is not quality. OK, I, you tell me what quality is at that age. You tell me at that young age as to what you would like from a player who cost us less than five million quid. You know, it's it's yeah, yeah I, for me, I think that there's a real potential for him. If it doesn't work out, we lose no money, do we? And he ends up going somewhere else. But there is a talent there. There's still a lot to dig out from him. So we'll have to um, agree to disagree on that one. Um, Alan. Fabio Carvalho, which side of the fence are you sitting on? Are you of the opinion that you think there's a chance that he's on his way out the door? He's not good enough for <clears> but <throat> that there's still something worth salvaging there? Um, to be honest with you, I think um, when he came, I think it was a little unfortunate at the time when he came and the, um, the squad he kind of landed into, really, because as you say, it would probably, in an ideal world, you would have changed the team that started that season rather than the season after, um, which obviously might have helped him quite a lot. Um, obviously, the bit you did see him, I kind of agree with some of the comments on both sides, really. I, I do feel when he did try and play in midfield, I think the Premier League is an incredibly fast league. Now, although I know he played for Fulham, I think you know, obviously he's not a massively experienced player. I think the fact he is you know, relatively small in stature. So it does take a bit of use to get getting used to, you know, the demands of the Premier League at that size. However, that all said, technically, he's got the ability, mm. but he needs to grow into his body. Now, I think if he'd have not gone on loan this year, mm. the way our injuries have fell into it, could he have got in the way some of the kids have and done a bit of a job? I think so. Because you look at some yeah. of those kids, they're not big. They're not like they're technically good players. Yeah. Um, so could he have fitted into that particular part? Quite possibly. 
But it's interesting, I think, when whoever does come in as manager, I think has to kind of, you know, you know, open book for everybody and treat them as they actually see. Now, obviously, if someone comes in and plays a certain formation which he can fit into, then if he's got the ability, as you said, if he hasn't, we'll get our five million back easily. So it's not a loss. Um, so I'm all for, you know, giving some of the youngsters a chance because I think if we have a squad of players, you know, who are talented and young, they grow together. And if he can fit into that, that's only a good thing. My only worry for him is really because he's not established yet. If a new manager comes in, who might want to bring players he knows well, who have got a bit more, you know, experience. Mm. He might be someone who comes um, under the radar of getting sent on loan or possibly even sold. Most possibly, and I think you know, I think you really touched on a really good point there about we've been so positive, haven't we, about these young lads coming into the team who are six months, eight months, nine months younger than Fabio. Uh, Jarrell Kwanzaa has come in, been absolutely outstanding. No one saw that coming. Absol- I don't know. I don't think the club saw it coming either, to be honest with you. And it came out really well for him. We've seen Bobby Clark's come on there and he's had some really good moments. We've seen um, McConnell come in there and have some really good moments and make some mistakes. You know, all these players have made some errors and, and it's great when things are going good for you because the mistakes don't hurt you. But last season... Everything wasn't all that well in the LFC camp, to be honest with you. So I think that your young players like Fabio, who he is and he was, aren't being given a fair crack of the whip that that they should be. Um, just going to go through a couple of the comments that we've had in here because we've had a really good chat this evening. And I really appreciate everyone who's put them in there. It really helps us to have this discussion. Firstly, uh, Jenna put this up before. Super sticker to the channel. We really, really appreciate you supporting the channel. It means a lot to us with you with your four ninety nine super sticker. Thank you very, very much. We support this channel all the time, and, and honestly, it 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 goes it goes really well for us. Thank you so much. Uh, so I just wanted to put out the uh, sweeter. Uh, he said I was talking BS before. Uh, Fabio is another overrated Brazilian. He's not Brazilian, he's Portuguese. And effectively, he's also English as well, mate. So just, just put it out there. All right. Um, anyway, um, moving on down with a few more comments here talking about Carvalho saying he's too small, he's too lightweight. There's been, but then there's some other comments and saying it's not always the case. Harvey Elliott's not the biggest of lads either, and he seems to cope, he seems to learn, and he's he's developed. He's a player who's developed in our team, and, and he's got better he still splits opinion he's still not everyone's cup of tea and i think that there is obviously a fully established liverpool player there in harvey elliott and i, I still feel that there's a real good opportunity for fabio carvalho to be a very good asset to this club at the price that he came at now we have a lot of discussion around managers 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 is what we've been talking about we're not hearing an awful lot from them because rightfully show, two of the managers that we're looking at and we're discussing are in title fights. Xabi Alonso complete, is unbeaten in all competitions. His numbers are incredible. He is the main man for me. He's the manager who I want. I find it difficult to find arguments for other ones. His his numbers this season have been incredible. Everything points towards him being the one that we should have, unless, of course, you're Florian Pletigol, who then says that apparently he's only going to buy Munich and we're not getting him. And it seems a little bit out of the out of the fact that Leverkusen or Alonso or anyone in, related to those camps, whilst they're in a, a Bundesliga title fight, would even make comment towards what the next steps are going to be. Gentlemen, um, we've been there and we've done it. Xabi Alonso, he's got to be the main man, hasn't he? Anyone disagree with me? Feel free to jump in if you disagree. Is he the main man? No, I agree. He's the number one for me. I would have Alonso. But I would have um, Ruben, the sport and Lisbon manager, as my backup. That would be my backup. I don't, I don't, I don't want the Zerbi. I know we got to talk about the Zerbi, but yeah, I don't want, I don't want the Zerbi. What? Why? Why does everybody hate uh, Roberto the Zerbi now? Like, I don't, you know, br- br- because he's terrible. I don't. He's not terrible, terrible, Dan. He is not a terrible manager. He's terrible. I he think he's, terrible. I think he's decent, but obviously Brighton are going through. Uh, what's it called? Not a great season this season. Last year he done quite good for them, but this season it's kind of like raw, like raw reverse. Excuses. Um, okay, Come on, Dan. Okay, Get him so, out there. Come okay, on, okay, jump okay. in. Okay. 
<laughs> well, I mean, okay, so I think we're being a bit unfair to Brian and the Zerbi right now. Like, one, uh, Brian have are in Europe for, I think, the first time ever, so they don't have a big squad, so they're struggling with the extra <laughs> games. Two, they've had really bad injuries. Now we've all had bad injuries, and he hasn't dealt with that pretty well. And three, his goalkeeper's terrible. So, like, I, I feel like that we're talking about Roberto de Zerbi as, like, <laughs> You know, last year he was hot butter, and now he's like he's in a relegation fight. Like Roberto De Zerbi still done pretty well with Brighton Hove Albion. Like they're they're still a very very good team. He's definitely that, not the hot commodity I'm, anymore. That, but this could happen. I'm, this could happen I'm, with Shabby Alonso. I'm just saying. I'm like, just Shabby, searching. I'm just searching for my wallet. I'm just searching for my wallet with my debit card in. Yo, Tony Bloom's one. He adds 150 million. Where's his new players? Why has he not got new players to come in, Dan? Why has he not signed anyone? Dan, Dan sounds like a Deserbi's his number one choice. That's yeah, cool. Dan Zerbi in. Get him in. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not, I'm not saying Roberto Deserbi is my number one manager. I want uh, Xavi Alonso too because I've mentioned before in the past, I think Xavi just ticks so many different boxes. My, you, you have to remember when they sold Moises Caicedo, it was like the middle of August and they weren't going to get a lot of players in real quickly. Um, so they didn't, even, and they still didn't spend money in January again, because of the, uh, FFP rules. Everyone was still worried about that. And they still haven't spent a lot of money. Like Brighton are probably not going to spend any money until like the summer, I would imagine. But again, like, like we mentioned with, I, I think Paul was talking about Tony Bloom in the comments, how good he is. Like Tony Bloom is just going to be functional. He's not going to overspend on Brian, especially now with the PSR rules, not again, far as getting a points deduction, Everton having, I think six now they have six points and they possibly could get more. I think Leicester have just been banned. Like they can't, they have a transfer ban already and they're going to get promoted. So I think right now this is just a general malaise in the market. Like Brian did buy players. They bought good players, but again, it's a new squad. They sold their best players. Um, Joao Pedro is a good player. He's still coming up. Evan Ferguson's still 19. So again, very talented, but still improving. Like, I feel like we need to like lay off like Roberto De Zerbi as like some terrible manager like terrible coach who, who has no idea what he's doing like he's a very very good coach brighton have just not have a good season and not having a good season for them is like ninth or eighth and they could still get europa conference next year i know i'm not i'm not saying i want roberto deserve to be the the next head coach of liverpool i think there are better options ahead of deserve but i think it's also like we shouldn't act like getting roberto deserve is like hiring Roy hodgson or something uh, if we hired Roberto De Zerbi, we're, we're not shopping in the right supermarket. That's my opinion. He, he's he's a manager who's found he's found his level. That's my opinion. He he's a, a mid table Premier League level manager. There's no clean sheets there. Where's the signings for the managers? Where's where's the signings? Where's the players? I mean, you've just said there about PSR. Brighton's PSRs through the roof. That they, they, they could buy anyone that they fancy. That they, they they made. X amount of hundred million pounds on Kaiseido. I mean, I know they have an obsession with locating the next mega superstar from South America, but that isn't a sustainable way of doing things because that's like playing the lottery over and over again. Eventually, you're going to get a player who just doesn't work out. They're not going to be the next Kaiseido. They're not going to be the next Alexis McAllister. They're not going to be those players. And for me, like. It was just that was an ownership side, and of course, the Zerbi can't be blamed for the fact that he's got the tools he's got to work with. But if he's just had Caicedo sold from underneath him, then it's down to him as a manager to go out there and say, No, if you're selling that player and you're going to receive X amount of money, I need reinvestment, these are the people I need to bring in. And he's he's never made comments towards that, and I, I, I found that one quite disappointing to be honest with you but we'll, we'll just we'll, we'll continue on just a moment with Alonso and then we'll come on to Deserbi I think that's a, a good segue for us to go on to uh Alan um Xabi Alonso it seems destined doesn't it that he's going to be our next manager there's no talk there's no there's no comments there's nothing coming out of the club there's nothing come out of anywhere unless of course you're Bayern Munich where apparently the only place he's going is Bayern Munich which for me could be mind games Xabi Alonso, is there anybody else who even comes close in your mind when it comes to the next manager? And if so, who is it? Um, simple question, simple answer. No, there's no one else I want. <laughs> or need. Just shut the club. Um, yeah, just that's it. Stop, stop it all. Um, no, it. Um, simple, a simple reason. Obviously, the playing connection obviously is the path you play for. Is obviously a big thing. Yeah. But if we 
put that to one side and I want to come back down a second. If you just look at the way his team plays, mm-hmm. it's got a lot of what we do. And I think football obviously always evolves and you know, you have you look at certain managers now, you know, you look at Benitez and Mourinho, once unbelievable managers, football kind of have grown to the right way, just moved on. And they're kind of stuck at when they when they were in their pump. And obviously, I think Klopp said it a few weeks ago that obviously, you know, his and Pep football one day will soon be outgrown, whether it be bettered, another story, but it'll be football will move on again. Um, and he thinks Alonso is the best of the next generation of managers. And you watch how they play, you can see how exciting they are. And I think the players that Leverkusen have got, I think if you had the players we have in that particular um, formation, I think we will be even better than what they are. Because I think okay. our players, you know, I think they're a little bit above them. I might that might come back and bang me in the backside if Leverkusen beats us in the final. But you know, um, I'll blame you. Don't worry, I'll blame you. That's fine. Yeah, you can find me. Um, yeah. But I, I want Alonso um, because obviously I don't know how old you guys are. I'm forty two, so. When I was, I was, I was a season ticket when I was 18, and what, you'd always have a play when they leave, break your heart, and he was the one. When he left to go to Madrid, it broke my heart. He was the one I just loved. In uh, that period, he was, he was the one. Oh, yeah, well, Gerard was in the team, but Gerard never left. Gerard I was, was in the best in Liverpool. I was thinking uh, Torres. Uh, uh, possibly, but... You know, Alonso was for me because I just loved him. I just thought, because you think of Alonso came in 2004 5, you know, he left in 2009. I just loved him. He just was just class. Um, Torres was a different heartbreak because the way it fell out, I felt Torres wasn't the same player when he left. Um, because Torres got into the, the season before he left against Benfica in the quarterfinal of the um, Europa League. And he came back just in time for the World Cup. And he, when he came back the following season, his pace had gone, he wasn't the same player. Where Alonso was just getting to his peak, yeah. and we had the whole Gareth Barry stuff and all that game. <laughs> and then when he never, when he then left, and I remember oh, yeah, watching on Sky Sports and means, and um, it showed him running out in his Real Madrid gear to go and train. Like, oh no, that hurts. And so for me personally, he's got to finish business, he has to come back. And I think he has set as close to the same. The only regret he's got in life, football wise, is he never won the Premier League with Liverpool. But guess what? Let's go make that right. Come back and win it for us. It's all set up for a dream, isn't it? That's that's the plan. This is the this is the destiny, Dan, isn't it? So Xabi Alonso, he's the man, isn't he? Go on then, tell me he's not. <laughs> I'm not. Listen, I I've never said for. I have never. I, I feel like this. I feel like people are starting to develop a narrative in their head that is counter to what I'm trying. I'm to just say. making one. No, I know. I know you are dead. You're setting me up to be crucified. Great here. entertainment. <laughs> Listen, I think Xabi Alonso ticks a lot of boxes uh, mm. that Gerard could have ticked like three or four years ago. Great personality, attachment to the club, mm. like very secure in his like identity as a coach and a manager. Though he mm. is. I think I think what times we're we're kind of thinking that Xabi Alonso is some tor- some is similar to like a Guardiola when he was younger or a Klopp when he was younger, or someone who's very much an ide- ideologue. Alonso is very much more of a enchilati in the sense of he builds his like he he gears it towards the team rather than like this is how I want to play football and this is what we're going to go do. So I know I've seen some people mention uh, Shabby's how Shabby plays football in the in the chat. Like Leverkusen this year don't play the way we play. They are much slower in build up. They are much less direct. They it is a much more patient, but you can argue intentional way of playing. Maybe it mimicked how we played two or three or four years ago when we had mm-hmm. the twenty the title winnings that we had where we were, you know, it was very intense, but it was also very like we would sideways pass a lot. Henderson, White Out win the ball, retain the ball, move it, move it back, move in these uh wide spaces with our fullbacks. But if Alonso came in, he probably would say, okay, I'm going to play direct 4-4-2 or 4-2-3-1 or something very narrow. He may go 3-5-2, he may go 3-4-3, yada, yada. It doesn't really matter what he would play. It's all hypothetical. Yeah. But I want Chevy Alonso to do it just because I feel like it's being set up to where Alonso could come in and all he has to do is coach. And like, yes, he can buy players and obviously, but the way that the structure is being built, 
or I guess being adapted from how it's been, is that more authority for transfers and all the sporting side is going to be with the directors, the executives, and kind of more behind the scenes stuff. And the manager's job is mostly going to be to manage the players and to coach the players and kind of to, and to be a, a voice at the table, but not the overwhelming personality that Jurgen Klopp has been. We've seen Bingo be in the past and Ferguson be in the past as well. The reason mm-hmm. I keep having these hypotheticals is that there is a world where we don't have Xabi Alonso as the manager, and that world doesn't mean that Liverpool get reg- relegated. I'm saying that it could be an Amaran who is a very good manager and a coach, uh, a Roger Schmidt at a Benfica, who again is very similar to Klopp. Again, a very good coach, could play a 4 4 2 very direct style. You know, there may be a world where it is Roberto De Servi who is the next manager of Liverpool. I don't think it's going to happen. I'm just saying there is a universe where that happens. I don't think it's this one, but it is a possibility. And I think that we need to kind of have this understanding that it's not like Shabby Alonso is the greatest coach that ever lived. Everyone else is garbage because that's just not, that's just not true by any stretch of the imagination. I think it's going to be Shabby Alonso. I'm like 95% sure that he'll be the next manager of Liverpool. I think that all the tactics from Bayern have been to unsettle him and Leverkusen. But I mean, for me, I think the possibility is that it's either going to be Alonso, uh, sorry, Alonso going to either be at Liverpool or Leverkusen. I don't think he's going to go to Bayern, especially not right after winning the title. And then after Alonso, I think for Liverpool, the decision is going to be either. Uh, I think it was they said it was either going to be Nagelsmann or Amarin. I think Amarin's the second favorite. I think if it's not Alonso, it's going to be Amarin. And those are the two ones. And then everyone else after that, it's like a third or fourth or fifth. You can just name swap Nagelsmann or Schmidt or any of these other uh, coaches that have been uh, looking for new jobs. Yeah, um, great way to great way to segue actually into uh, my second choice um, based on based on nothing other than what I think Michael Edwards will do and what Liverpool will do when it comes to who they're going to employ next. Um, your comments on Liverpool will be recruiting a head coach as opposed to a manager. I, I completely agree with. I think that that is the way that we're moving towards within football. The the manager becomes less this deity-like figure that we have at Liverpool that Jurgen Klopp has become as because when that happens it also comes with a side of it that we saw at, at, at Manchester United to a, to a certain degree and to a much greater degree that we saw at Arsenal under Arsene Wenger is that at times it, that the power of one person can have actually eventually become a real problem if it goes the wrong way or they leave and that is something which I think that, that we're moving towards so that we don't have this situation perhaps in the future. Now, Ruben Amarin, Portugal Sporting Lisbon manager, 2.6 points, uh, 2.6 points per match this season in the Portuguese league. Uh, 21 wins, two losses, two draws. It's it's very good numbers it's in, in a much... Some would say a more competitive league than the Bundesliga, except for the simple fact that Normally, it's just Bayern Munich who wins the Bundesliga and everyone else has sort of come second. Um, it's type of football, 3-4-3, three, three, something that has been t- talked about in the past with us going to three at the back, potentially changing our formation. That's his preferred style of football. He also makes having um, a, an armband on your left arm look really cool, to be honest with you. I think that might be a new style that if he was to come to Liverpool. Um, Ruben Amarin... I'm not against it, but it, the the problem for me is is that he comes as he, he's a second, but he's not a second like he's here. He's a second like he's down here. I feel like the drop off is into where I feel that one that he would fit in a lot better within the club. He would be given a lot more time and a lot more um, a lot more rope if things don't go so well to begin with because of his previous connection to the club. Were a manager from outside the sphere of Liverpool in this situation, because we're getting rid of a manager, my concern would be is, is that there might potentially be this sort of clamour towards us maybe becoming a little bit more a kind of reactionary to the situation that's in front of us, that we know that we're not ready to kind of understand that perhaps next season might not go the way that we want it to. Maybe it does, maybe it goes fantastically. And a second manager and a manager who isn't someone who is already within that sort of built up that level of sort of credit in the bank like Jerry Alonso has. We're looking at young managers and Amarin, Alonso, Deserbi all fit that that criteria, which is something which we all think that we're going towards here at Liverpool. So Ruben Amarin, Alan, 
I know you've just said no to anyone else uh, when it comes to the second managers, but your opinion on Ryu Namorin, let's say Xabi Alonso tells us, no, I'm seeing out my contract, I'm not going anywhere else. Is is he potentially your second choice, or, or are you taking charge? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take charge. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think, obviously, I, I can't say I know massively a lot about him obviously compared to Jabby because obviously my connection with uh, Alonso and the pool um, but you know when you see sport and play you do see you know they play good football I just think anyone who comes in after club has got a really really hard challenge um, just because I think with Liverpool I know you said before obviously about obviously we're going down the more head coach rather than the manager I think anyone who comes in as a head coach, the way Liverpool's fan base is, if you do well, the fans get behind what would be the head coach that much, that they will become so powerful. It then falls down, will Liverpool be too big a club for someone like him um, because of his experience? Now, you could say Alonso hasn't got that much experience, I get that, but he's been here before. That's probably one of the reasons why I'd want him. Um, whether, um, obviously, um, the lads of Sporting can obviously come in, start playing good football. I think the thing is, next season, I think we all as fans have got to understand it's going to take possibly a little while to get us going, potentially, because obviously, with there being the Euros in the summer and whatever players are away, you, you, you can ideally do with this, with no Euros in, so the players come back on time. So they can kind of go off and get a good pre-season under the belt. Because I do feel, because these players have been so used to playing Klopp's way for such a long time, he's going to come in and try and put his stamp on whoever it is. Um, and I think the size of the club might just be a little bit um, bigger for a lot of managers. Um, but, you know, if he comes in, he gets my support. Um, I can't say I'd want him because we all know who I want. But if the guy, Alonso, doesn't come to us and he gets the job, I think he plays good football, which is what he wants. And from the, the stats you get before, it's clearly winning football. Yeah. Um, it's just a worry about the size of the club and the size of the league and who he'd be going up against, potentially, obviously, with Pep, how he would cope. But guess what? We'll never know until it happens, will we? That's it. Absolutely. Totally agree with you. Uh, Reese, uh, Ruben Amarin. Um... We love Portuguese football. We love the league. We love some of the players who come in from there. I mean, why not have a Portuguese manager? It makes sense, doesn't it? Do, do you do you see him as your second choice, or is there somebody else who, who comes in front of him? For me, I don't know too much about him either, but he would be my second from what I've seen of him. Um, I like obviously my main main choice is Alonso because of the playing for Liverpool, the connection I had, watching him play and stuff like that. But um, I think the landscape of managers at the minute, uh, it's a lot of young managers. It's not really like how it was. Personally, for me, when I was growing up, there was loads of older managers. So sometimes some of the fan base might want an older manager, but it's like, who who, who are you going to get, um, really? You know what I mean? So uh, in terms of like the young managers being inexperienced, this, that's what the kind of landscape is like right now. But yeah, Alonso first and then Ruben Amorin uh, second for me yeah absolutely Dan Ruben Amorin um, tell me why he comes third behind De Zerbi for you <laughs> <laughs> uh, well it's obviously because uh, De Zerbi has much better spiky hair uh, no listen I, I think we I think at times that Amorin we have to remember like I know uh, Alan mentioned like the personalities and the the kind of like the the, the weight of trying to fight in the Premier League you have to remember about sporting, just some quick things. Ruben Amarin won the first title in 20 years. And sporting, when he took over, was in a mess. They they literally had the Ultra Storm, their trading ground in 2018. So about two years before he arrived. So they were a mess. They had some of their best players. They had to sell them at a discount. Uh, they were in bad financial state because of COVID as well. So sporting, sporting was going through what Ajax was, is going through right now, where like they were just terrible like as as a football institution as like a coach he had great that town of players but they just could not perform and then emmerin comes in he wins their first title in 2020 and they he's been pretty competitive with them against the likes of benfica 
and uh, Porto, who are a bit, or obviously the two other big sides, um, both uh, Benfica and Lisbon with uh, Sporting Lisbon and Porto obviously being in Porto. But the, I think we have to remember that Emerin is very much fighting as like the third best. He's, fight, he's, he's fighting in a league where he has the third best team usually, and he's always usually punching above his weight, which if you think about what a Liverpool manager, one of the qualities you need is like, how do we take a side and get them to punch above like what they usually are. That's what Klopp was able to do. He's able to get a team together and make it better than the sum of its parts. Uh, even this Liverpool team moving forward, as young as we are, as talented we are, versus maybe mm-hmm. maybe what we were four or five years ago, you need someone that's going to come in and maximize that team. And I think Amaran has shown that he can do that when he doesn't have like the financial resources or the uh, players available like a Benfica or a Porto has. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, Again, I, I jest on the basis because I, I have absolutely convinced myself that Xabi Alonso is the one. I can I can see you know it already work, and I can already see him galvanising a fan base in a situation which we're about to say goodbye to, perhaps the most influential manager that the club has had since someone like a Shankly. Maybe the numbers of trophies haven't been as vast as, say, for example, Paisley went on to. But what he did was is he changed our club, a club that went from being, as rightfully mentioned before, a club that was facing administration, a club that didn't have any money, a club that was you know, almost put into the ground by our previous ownership. And FSG's taken a long time to get us back to where we are, and this is where we are. We're at the top of the table. We're dying at the, as one of the richest clubs in, in football, and we have the ability to go after some of the best managers. And and you kind of want to get in there like a player. You want to get your young managers, your up-and-coming, your next big things coming out of football right now because this is the time to get them. This is the kind of point where you can get them nailed down and they can come in there. And Ruben Amarim, as you've rightly said, Dan, it, the numbers are great. He's took over a club who aren't the biggest powerhouse in, in their league. He's been able to turn them around. He's galvanised the fan base. They play very good, positive football. They have a really good brand. They've been able to get good results out of players who who ultimately, you know, they don't jump out at you. And, and I wouldn't be... They're- Oh, their best striker, hard. their best striker, Victor Gorias, struggled at Coventry in the championship. Like he's like he's twenty five. He has twenty. I think he has twenty five goals. He w- he struggled at Coventry. He's getting like like a European Golden Boot out of him and and uh, the Premier Liga. Well, that's what I was actually going to say. Coventry, because my dad lived down there for twenty five years. Coventry is my second team, so I knew about Victor, and he's been there for a long, long time, and. It just goes to show, doesn't it, that at times when you just get the right play pull and you get the right person who's got the right eye, that they can get the results out of them. And Victor has done brilliantly there. And apparently he's been talked about going to Arsenal for 100 million quid and all this big, you know, shebang. Not bad for a lad who was struggling in the championship only 12 months ago. So, yeah, it's good good work if you can get it, to be honest. Um so, yeah, Ruben Amarin, I, I wouldn't be against it. I wouldn't be overly, like, really upset. I would get massive through behind the manager, of course. I can see a lot of the positives. But the positives, they're just... It's hard to get away from the idea of having somebody who, not only as a player, won everything. He's won it all. The World Cup, the Euros. You know, his his... Even at the young age that he is at 44, as a manager, is a young one. He's able to walk into a room and command the respect of absolutely everybody because he's able to say, I've won everything and more. So that is really positive for us, even though his managerial record is limited. It's brilliant so far, but limited. We don't have a lot of data to go off. Same with Ruben Amarin. So, yeah, I'd be interested in Ruben Amarin. Um Roberto De Zerbi, <laughs> um, I'll quickly go over him before my wild cards come out there. Again, I think he's... Of course, I just, he is a good manager. Yes, he is. But I just don't feel, looking at the data and looking at the information and looking at the what we've seen so far, I don't feel that he is as good yeah. as, as where we should be. I don't think he's as good as to where we could have got him to be from. I think the numbers that he put up when he went over to Shakhtar, fantastic, 60%, 67% win record. He probably should get that with Shakhtar Donetsk. He's come over here. The football has been, um, I mean, 
this season not great. That let's let's put it that way. And there is reasons to why that they're, they're not getting the results that they would normally. Goalkeeper's not as great as he would be. Lost Caicedo, lost the best midfielder that they've ever had in their entire world when Alexis McAllister and he plays with us. And the points, one point five points a game. So they get, you know, they win one, lose one, win one, lose one as it comes to to that. And it's a for me, it's the no. They don't get any. There's no clean sheets that they get. I just don't. I just don't feel it for me. I don't feel like he is a manager who is in the same bracket as the two people we've just mentioned. And I think that's the reason why I'm, I'm so against it. Does anyone disagree with me on Deserby being in the same bracket, or is he in the bracket below? Dan, is he in the bracket below, or is he in the same one? Um, I think he's, I think he's in that bracket of managers that you could throw in the likes of like Thomas Frank, um, Graham Potter, uh, Graham Potter. Um, uh, even I think someone mentioned, I don't know why I said Graham Potter like that. Graham Potter, uh, Roberto de Zerbi, Graham Potter, <laughs> Graham Potter, uh, Graham Graham Potter. Potter, Thomas Frank and, uh, uh, Gary O'Neill, I think, which are very talented. Um, not English because Frank is a uh, Danish and, uh, de Zerbi is, uh, uh, Italian. But they're very talented, you know, 40-year-old managers, up and coming, new ideas, very much in the modern mold, you would say. You know, if you kind of think about like Klopp and Guardiola being from like the the hit names of the mid 2000s these are very much the the hit managers for the modern day that could go on and take big jobs, or they could languish and become the next, you know, uh Sam Allardyce or even like ex uh, England manager Sam Allardyce. Yeah, exactly. Is that who yeah. you're talking about? <laughs> exactly. One hundred percent win record. Uh, yeah, I think they're, I think they're very much back. that that level below. Going back to like your Brendan Rodgers, uh, and even yeah. uh, who am I, uh, Roberto Martinez as well. Like those very talented up and coming managers, they're there. They're not the crop of like managers Still that are stuff. Cool. Yeah, like your Alonzos, your Schmitz, your Nagelsmanns, your Tuchels, your Amarims. Uh, insert any like even Luis Enrique or Carlo Ancelotti. You know these these managers that have already won have shown that they can coach good attacks and you know you know what you're gonna get when they come in Salah's gone move on I didn't know what you're what? talking about uh, is he Salah. gone <laughs> tell I me where he's know. gone I think he went to the store but that's about on holiday it. well no it is it is Ramadan so like he probably went to go break his fast so I, I don't that's it so yeah to tell me where he's gone anyway so, yeah so <laughs> I but that's, I don't think I don't think they're gonna hire a Deserby a Frank uh, a Potter or a uh, who was the other one I mentioned uh, in that category? Tuchel. Um, no, no. I, oh, Gary O'Neill. I don't think they're going to hire anybody like that. No. You know, the, the, the up and the kind of managers that have that are up and coming that haven't won anything yet. They're very much going to try and get someone that has worked within the system, and they're like they've shown they can win, but they also show they can maximize a lot of the squad. That's my opinion. I just think we need to pretend and stop acting like Roberto Deserbi is Roy, Roy Hodgson. Is my is my is just my that's my thing. Let's just calm down now. Let's pump the brakes. I can. Um, Alan, um, Roberto De Zerbi, Alberto VO5, stocks would fly up in Liverpool if he came. Um, any other points as to why you would see De Zerbi at Liverpool? Uh, no, I, I agree with a lot of what Dan just said. Um, I do think he's not as bad as he's getting made out to be. Yeah, that one, the one below you. Um, <laughs> not, as, um, not as bad as he's made out to be. Um I think obviously he does have an ability, but I think like as some other managers, he just hasn't obviously proven it. And I think as you said before, with um FSG, they kind of learn from potential mistakes. So when obviously was actually went and the obviously sorry, when Kenny went and he went and brought in Brendan Rogers, he was kind of an up and coming manager. Let's see if he can, you know, hit the jackpot and in fairness to him, he was quite close, to, you know. And talked about team. great character, didn't he? A lot, yeah, great exactly, character, yeah, yeah, you know. great character, yeah. unbelievable yeah. player. We yeah. Joe, <laughs> Joe Allen. We Joe Allen. <laughs> yeah, so so we so we had um, he had a what's it called? So you know, he was one of those guys where he hasn't quite made it before he came to Liverpool, and unfortunately for him, he just didn't quite get at Liverpool. And obviously, then from then he went and got someone who obviously in Klopp is obviously at least won things before. So I think with the likes of this A B, you can kind of see managers like him potentially maybe getting a job, not at the top table at like a Liverpool level, but maybe a little bit higher than Brighton, where he might potentially go on and you know maybe win some trophies of some kind. And that's time when I was going to say Spurs, but they don't win anything. Well, exactly. 
and then you kind of go up to that sort of like potential like at the Liverpool level. Yeah. But I don't think he goes from Brighton to Liverpool um, because he hasn't got that winning um, background. Now, and then Alonso up to now was one nothing. I think this season he might hopefully win two things for them, not three. Um, it's won our hearts. Yeah, so, well, yeah, that could be the third thing he wins. Um, but it would be great to, to obviously be at the, on the pitch in, in, in Dublin and we win the cup and he's standing next to us watching it, you know, and clock gives him a handshake and says, right, over to you. We'll that stick him on the plate with us. We take yeah, we yeah. take the cup and bring Alonso with us as well. It'd be the yeah, it'd yeah. be yeah. absolutely yeah. dramatic, could, well, let's be honest. It could be on uh, the tour when we tour the city. That's it. Uh Reese uh Deserby um convince me. Is he is is he is he possible or is he just on we bark up the wrong tree talking about him? I don't think he's the one for us. Like I agree with um, Alan and Dan. He's not as bad as he's made out. He's not Ray Hodgson. He's not that level. But um, I just, me personally, I don't think him and Liverpool suit. And I think he's more, he's more suited to, for me, if someone was to go and get him, maybe Man City, if they, after Guadalupe, he, he strikes me as he's more like, he's got similar traits to Guadalupe. He's very like, um, if you watch, when he doesn't win games, um, he throws his toys out the pram. I think he's, Sent uh, certain uh, messages. Um, I mean, like um, indirects towards the Brian owners um, in terms of certain players. I think uh, to leave and stuff like that. But for me, no, I'd rather not him. It's, it's Alonso number one, and then Ruben Amra number two. Um, for me, absolutely. I'm glad we put that one to bed about him. We never have to talk about him ever again. Um, right now, somebody who I'd like to bring up because he's not been discussed. And as far as I'm aware, it's not been discussed anywhere within the large media circles, which I've been following when it comes to the Liverpool's next manager. And he's a name I'd like to bring in. He doesn't fit the young manager role because he's not. He's actually slightly older than Jurgen Klopp. Now, I don't think that's a problem. I don't think Jurgen's actually retiring. I think we'll see Jurgen back in a dugout at some point within the next few years, whether that's international, whether that's in another league. Now, Roger Schmidt, he is Benfica's manager and this season and he has played 100 matches. He has a points per match of 2.33 at PSV Eidhoven, played 100, had 404 matches, 2.16 points um, resulted. He was a Salzburg manager, 2.24 manager. Um, he, he's a manager who has been at Leverkusen, funnily enough, as well, and, and didn't quite work quite as well at, at Leverkusen, to be to, totally honest. But he was at 1.7 points per match, which for Leverkusen, who are normally previous to this, are around fifth or sixth in their league, um, which fits probably about right as to where they were. Now, f- for me, he's 20 games, won four draws, two losses, 64 points. He's two points behind. He's a manager who would make sense for us. And, and, and why is it that we need a young manager? Do, do we feel that it's absolutely necessary that we go in and get one of these young managers right away? Because for every time that we've discussed managers so far who were interested in, Xabi Alonso, brilliant. We're all on that board. Currently invincible over in Leverkusen. He's putting Bayern Munich to the sword, which is lovely to see. Rio Namorin, again, another manager, young, points are doing well, won them a title for the first time, something which is brilliant to see. He's actually got them a title first time in, in, I don't know how long, a couple of decades. 20 years. 20 years in a couple of decades. I knew it was on the tip of my tongue. And having somebody to come in there now, the thing that they don't have is they don't have great bodies of work when it comes to the data, which is something that Liverpool like to have. They're a, they're a, a club who uses data and information and feeds into the system to try and make good bets and, and gamble its risk because these aren't you know small prices that we're paying for these managers or players. And we need to try and get more right than we get wrong. And looking at a manager like Xabi Alonso looks great, doesn't it? But however, it, it's it's a small portion, same as Ruben Amarin. Again, it's a small portion of information, which hopefully, if they do come to us, either of them come to us, it carries on and, and, and that is their stand and that's where they are. But we've also seen where that data can sometimes come and bite us in the backside in a little bit of a way. 
Darwin Nunez's numbers over at Benfica were absolutely off the charts. They, they were absolutely unbelievable. However, they didn't quite carry on into the Premier League, which you can expect. However, some of the stats which we would hope to continue, which would have been when he's had the chances, he scores the goals and it hasn't quite happened. And sometimes people just level out. My risk is, is it going to be a levelling out? Now, someone like Schmidt, um, Roger Schmidt, the information's there. All the data's there that we need us to have. We, he's got a long record. He's got hundreds and hundreds of matches under him, under his name. He's managed some really big clubs, Salzburg, Leverkusen, PSV Eidhoven and Benfica. Is there any reason as to why that we couldn't make a, a decision like that and look at a manager like Schmidt or are we just getting onto the line that we have to have a, a new, young and up-and-coming manager? Reese, what, what, do we Are we hung up on the idea of getting a young manager and is it absolutely necessary we do that? Um, I don't think it's necessary. I think if there's an older manager out there, like I, like I said, obviously you know about this, this the person you just mentioned. I don't really know too much about him I just, I, I just i just i just i just think the landscape i just think the landscape um is kind of young managers right now that's why so that's why you're going to be linked with more young managers there's more young hot property young managers than older managers but if they're like i said if you want to give them a chance that's up to you i don't really know too much about it. i'm just happy with the two the two main choices that we have which is Alonso and uh, Ruben. I've not sold them to you, clearly. Uh, Alan, um, your opinions. Roger Schmidt, um, doing well, really good history. You know, we was easily attainable for a club like Liverpool. He's got the his he's got the, the numbers, the numbers back him up. They're very similar to Ruben Amarin, currently in the same league. It, w is there a reason why that w we should go against someone like that? No, not necessarily a reason to go against them. Um, I think what you're probably trying to do, because of the age of the squad that we have, you wouldn't have the deal where like, to get a young manager. Like, well, Alonso's 42, so he's got um, plenty of age on his time to build, I hate the word dynasty, but you know, you can go and build a, a team and then build it again when they age out. Um, but the likes of Smith again, I don't know a lot about him. Um, but obviously one thing he has over the is he's got a lot more managerial experience. Whatever that's at is another story, but he's got a lot more experience. I think in an ideal world, if Alonso said no because he wants you know, because other we all want to come and the Kessel and all that, you know, let's think of it on a personal level for him, you know, he's got young children who were obviously settled in Germany and, you know, in, maybe in school and all this type of stuff. We all want to be romantic with Liverpool, but let's be honest, family comes first. I think if you could say to me now, he says, oh, I'm going to stay in Leverkusen, I want to give the Champions League a crack with Leverkusen and then see me contact out and that's the same as two years I might be. Getting someone like the guy you talk about on Benfica, that then would make a little bit more sense because you could kind of get him in to kind of see over we've got now, knowing full well that in a couple of years' time, when Jab is ready, you would then look to try and get him. But if you bring another younger manager in, and that younger manager then sometimes you know, gets going good, which is great for the club, it then potentially, it's like sliding doors moments, a long of chance might have gone. Uh, because then he might go and rip her up in Spain or he might then end up on Munich and you would always be, oh, that could have been us. So I would probably have him as a sort of a, a choice based on what goes on with Jabby's decision for me personally. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, that, that does that just put it out there. I mean, I always think there's a thing with Liverpool is... is we're a club who normally doesn't open the door very often when it comes to managers because we normally stick with them. We're not like a Chelsea or a, or a Bayern Munich or a Real Madrid who you know change the managers every two to three years or if you've Chelsea recently every six weeks. Um, it'd be interesting to see as to whether or not that is a possibility. Perhaps he does come to you know his perspective buyers, his perspective new employers, Alonso, and says to buy and says to Liverpool, you know, I'm not ready to move on. I still want to learn. I still feel there's a lot that I personally, where I am, is my point in my career. I feel that as much as my ego tells me I want to take those jobs right now, perhaps maybe there's still a few little bits and pieces that I want to add to my 
my resume there's a few bits that i want to be able to add to my experience before i then go on and take one of those jobs because it can also go wrong can't it and it can go wrong quite quickly we've seen that with other managers we've seen that with steven gerrard who i felt took the jump too quickly he had a brilliant season over at rangers and when the aston villa job came around i i was obviously watching from a liverpool point of view of going don't take the job not because he would be managing against us but more on the line being i still think there's stuff that you can be learning and a job like the aston villa job massive respect to aston villa will come available again that job will be available again. Uh, uh, the Newcastle job would have been available to him. The Aston Villa job would have been available to him. The Spurs job perhaps would have been available to him at this point had he stayed, maybe at Rangers, maybe learned his craft a little bit more. Because when you do make your mistakes and you make them in a league that isn't the Premier League, they're easier to take. The, the, the pressure is less so. Where when, With him at Aston Villa, it went wrong very quickly. And unfortunately, He's kind of gone out into the wilderness. Now, I'm not saying that that's going to happen with us, and I'm sure Liverpool will do everything they can to make sure that that isn't going to be the case. Um, but someone like Roger Smith coming in for a year, two years, if Alonso, for example, had said that he wanted to stay, maybe that works. Maybe it does. Dan, you've mentioned Schmidt. I think you're a little bit more knowledgeable on him. Um with because you're pretty knowledgeable about football anyway um w w would he make sense because on on paper he does same as Amarin, so why not so i'm gonna answer your question by just doing a little oh can you hear me okay cool i'm gonna answer can't hear you oh you can't hear me oh really can you hear me now oh okay one second can you hear me? Well, now? Dan gets himself back home with his audio. I'm sure wait for him to come can, back through. He's uh, is, <laughs> to, is, can, <laughs> had to shout out the window to us. Um, oh, yeah, lads. Okay. So um, just while we're we're obviously waiting, we'll just go through some of the comments here. Um, let's have a look here. Let's can you hear me now? Gets himself back up and sorted. Uh, Paul's putting there. Roger Smith is not old. He's a year longer than than Ange Postecoglou. And Ange Postecoglou was actually a manager. It was mentioned before in our chat before. Anyone would anyone actually be interested in him coming to Liverpool? Do you think he's got what it takes to be the, the Liverpool manager, Alan? What, what do you make of Ange Postecoglou? Because to be honest with you, okay, I don't really see it. I think the football's quite interesting, but I, I don't yeah, see it, it being a progression. The, the points are pretty similar to where Conte was, so I mean, points win prizes, don't they? So, I mean, what, what do you make of that? Um, firstly, I can hear Dan, Dan, I can hear you. I can hear Dan as well. Yeah. I can hear Dan. Um, regards to Ange. Sorry, um, boys, I can't hear you. Oh, okay. I can. I can hear you, but I you can... can't hear me, which is a bit strange. No, I can hear you. Dan. Uh, can you hear hey, me? chat. Can you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, I, can I can hear you. you. Just uh, to put it out there. Put your hand up if you can hear me. <laughs> okay, so everyone can hear me. Right, yeah. I can't hear you. Right, <laughs> That's a bit rare, okay. thingy. Um, right, gentlemen. Um, with that, I'm gonna. If I drop out, Dan, give me a nod. Will this stay on? It will. I ha I have no idea. It should. You don't but, know. Yeah, I don't know because you'd have to be added back in. Right. Okay. Right. Um, everyone can hear us. Right. Okie dokie. Um, with that, because I can't hear you, and I don't know if this is gonna jump out. I'm gonna have to probably end the stream. Um, unfortunately. Yeah, is that all right with everybody, guys? Oh, yeah, that's yeah. good. Sorry, that's because good. I can't hear everyone. Um, I'm not going to be able to obviously answer the questions and put them back there, which is a real shame. But I've really enjoyed this evening's uh, conversation. Um, unfortunately, the technology has let me down. So, yeah, <laughs> Roberto De Zerbi, no. Alonso, yes. Amarin, maybe. Roger Schmidt, jury's out, perhaps. Um, everyone who's coming this evening, thank you very, very much. Dan. Reese, Alan, really, really appreciate this evening. It's, it's, it's been a really interesting chat, to be honest with you. Everyone who's coming to the comments, fantastic. I, I really do appreciate it, and all the people who are watching. If you're not already uh, subscribed, please do. Uh, stick us a like on the video. It, it, it really helps us as a channel. It helps us for, with the algorithm and more people find this interesting conversation. And, and we'll always do our very best to get people you know, uh, involved in the chat where, where we can. Um, so until uh, tomorrow, half seven, um, join us all then for the next uh, chat here on the LFC Transfer Room. Thank you very much. Take care. See you now. Bye-bye.